Good morning, everyone. Congratulations on braving what feels like a very chilly morning. Um, Let's stand together and worship God as we warm up together. You inhabit the praises of your people. You delight in the glory of your Son. In the love of the Father we will worship. In the kingdom of God we find our home. The wonder of your love will break the chains that bind us. The power of your touch releases us to worship. To God, sing hallelujah with all we are. We will worship you. Holy is your name, holy is your name, O God. And together we lift the name of Jesus. And together we Yeah. 
God, we want to thank you that we can worship you this morning. We want to thank you, Lord, that you are powerful, that you are mighty, that you have overcome. And Lord, we want to acknowledge that it's you alone that we trust. It's you alone that we worship. And Lord, this morning we pray that we might just relax into your arms, that we might be comforted and feel safe that um, yeah that you Lord are in control that you alone are our Lord and Savior Amen. my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus
Let me read to you from Psalm 30. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Well, good morning. Have a seat. It's great to uh, gather and rejoice together, isn't it? Um, I've been reflecting on that psalm this week, uh, so much so that I've, I've given it to all of you connect groups for this coming week to do your own reflection on the rest of that psalm. Um, so if you are in a group, you can look forward to that this week. Uh, if you're not in a group, let me know, and I'll find you one. There's a quick plug. Um, it wasn't in my notes, but, you know, it just com- comes out naturally. Uh, kids. Kids, kids, kids. Um, you guys have your kids' church starting now, so you may go find your teachers, find your leaders. They're all out the back. Have a great morning. It's lovely to worship with our whole church family, isn't it? Um, now, I have a few announcements this morning. We try not to have too many, uh, but we do have a few. The first one is, Lewis isn't here. Now, when I wasn't here two weeks ago, Lewis didn't tell you where I was. He just said you weren't here. And I'm tempted to do the same to Lewis, but I'm going to be the bigger man uh, Lewis is preaching at Greenhouse Church over at Long Jetty, uh, which is a church that was planted from this church a few years ago. Um, that's where I was two weeks ago. Now it's Lewis's turn. Uh, so that's where he is this morning. He'll be here tonight. He's preaching again tonight. He's a hard worker. Um, so if you miss Lewis, come tonight and you'll be able to see him. Uh, also, I've been instructed by our board to tell you uh, that we have a focus meeting next Sunday. I think you already know, because it was announced last week, and it's been in our newsletter, uh, so you should all know what's going on. But if you don't, we have a focus meeting next Sunday. Uh, We are going to find out... We're all very excited. We're going to find out uh, who our selection committee have done their due diligence and brought a name to us. They will bring their name next Sunday. So if you want to know what's going on with the search for a new senior pastor in this church, or or if you want to be part of asking some hard questions, or if you want to be part of voting uh, and uh, doing the the democratic thing, uh, then please come next Sunday. Uh, Especially come if you are a ministry partner with us. And if you don't know what that is, or if you'd like to become one so you can vote, uh, there is a ministry partnership course this afternoon at 3.45, I want to say. Is that right? Yeah, I'm seeing nods. That's good. 3.45 this afternoon here. Uh, if, you, if this is the first you've heard, uh, then read your newsletter. Um, <laughs> if this is the first you've heard uh, and you haven't RSVP'd, I think you can just show up anyway. We'll make it work. Um, so come along 3.45, become a ministry partner. And next Sunday, come along at 11-ish, straight after the morning service, we will have our focus meeting. That's all the news. They're the announcements. Um, the next thing is I'd like to invite Brooklyn up. Uh, oh, you've got a fan, Brooklyn. <laughs> oh, there's the rest of them. Um, I'm inviting Brooklyn up because this is your last Sunday with us for a while. Why are you leaving us? Um, I'm going to study a degree in, like, Viking culture in Iceland. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. I respect that. Um, Nick's already gone. He's gone on ahead, so you're going to meet him there. Um, but I thought it'd be great for us to pray for you before you go, uh, to send you off with our blessing, um, and to pray that you come back. <laughs> so how about we, we pray? 
Uh, Lord God, uh, we thank you, we praise you uh, for Brooklyn and for Nick, uh, for the blessing that they are to us as part of our community here. Uh, Lord, uh, we are excited for them, uh, and we pray, uh, Lord, that you would go ahead of them, that you go with them on this next adventure. Uh, Lord, I do pray uh, that you'd be really uh, blessing them uh, in, in this new, next season in their life as they go to Iceland. Uh, Lord, I pray that you provide friends for them there, a, a church family for them there. Uh, Lord, that you would be uh, really paving the way for them. Uh, and Lord, I do pray uh, that you would be deepening their relationship with you, deepening their faith in you uh, as they uh, go half, halfway around the world. Um, Lord, I pray uh, that you Bless Brooklyn in her studies, uh, Lord, that she would learn a lot uh, and grow and be challenged by that. Uh, Lord, I pray uh, that you would be speaking and leading and guiding them, uh, showing them the things that you have prepared for them in that place. Uh, Lord, that they would be uh, working for you and for your kingdom. Uh, Lord, that they'd be a blessing to the people there. Uh, and Lord, that you'd provide people there uh, to be a blessing to them as well just as they've been a blessing to us here. Uh, and Lord, I do pray that you keep them safe and that you'd bring them back to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have an awesome time. Keep in touch. <laughs> now, our other exciting guest for this morning uh, is Dr. Daniel C. Uh, Daniel is he's here he's going to come up come on up um daniel is a missionary uh with baptist missionaries australia baptist mission australia that's the one um and he's going to share with us uh, about his brand new work what are you a month in now aren't you yes one month in uh and we have just started supporting him as a church uh as you would know from a few weeks ago we announced that um, and he's going to share with us a bit of his story. Uh, if you would like more than the, uh, the little taster that you're about to get now, uh, he's going to stay around afterwards, and you can even come have lunch with us if you'd like. Um, so. Yeah, that was why I've got a, a pamphlet oh, yeah. in the info desk. Pamphlet in the info desk as well. So, yeah, over to you, Daniel. Yep. Tell us your story. Yep. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rio Johnny was telling me that I was going to talk about after the preaching. So, is that right? Yes. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> so, there's a surprise. <laughs> but I'm ready anytime that I'm ready to do this. So, first of all, thank you very much for partnering with me in this ministry. So I just have to turn around to see what's the slide. I thought that I will be seeing that uh, in, in front as well, but it, it, it didn't come up that way. So the ministry that I'm in is called Urban and Regional. And that is in First Nations Gospel Ministry. I think after starting for one month, I think I'll add one more word. It's First Nations Gospel Discipleship Ministry. I add the word discipleship because that is a very important component. Let me introduce my family first. Looking at this, you know that I have two daughters. I have uh, my wife, Fanny, and my eldest daughter, Emily, and youngest daughter, Sonia. One thing in common for four of us, we are all teachers. So both of them, they teach in school. My wife, she's a piano teacher and a ceramic artist. So we're very busy at home. We talk a lot uh, about education. And from this picture, you know how old I am. <laughs> because it's big and red. And I'm 60 years old. 
I became a Christian, committed my life to Jesus when I was year 10, that summer vacation. So when I became a Christian, my heart has been with that fire, and then I like to sing, I liked music, I like choir, so I spent a lot of time in fellowship, and of course, having that time, I, I, have, I didn't study enough, and I couldn't go to university, but God always has a plan for each one of us, preparing us for his mission. So you could see that I've been, from the start, instead of going to university, I was in the Hong Kong Polytechnic and became a hospital scientist. And then I worked for 11 years. Then I, when I was 32, I think that I have enough of the routine hospital work. And then I moved to England to study immunology. And now everyone knows about immunology because we all have vaccine. Multiple times, I had my fourth. But I focused in cancer immunology because my father, my parents, they didn't like me to leave my job in Hong Kong, sold my house in, in Hong Kong, and then went to England with my wife and my three years old daughter at that time. My father passed away because of cancer. So I decided to do cancer immunologist. And I came to, after PhD, I came to Sydney. That was 1998, 24 years ago already. And I've been using my, what I've learned from England as in Western medicine to study cancer immunology. I thought that is my focus. That is what God has prepared me to do this. But God always has his plan. We just have to discern what was God's view. In 2005, there is a big change. I have no time to tell you about that, that change, but I've changed from a Western medicine studying immunology to become studying herbal medicine. If you want to know more how that big change in my newsletter, there are some YouTube video that I've um, made that sharing in other churches. My supervisor in the hospital, in the Royal Prince Alfred, said, Daniel, you're doing a, a career suicide, moving to herbal medicine, no evidence. But for me, I'm saying, I choose cancer immunology because I want to find something useful for cancer patients, not because of just career. If herbal medicine is useful, but it hasn't got any proof, I want to help and show that proof. So I've got that opportunity from 2005 onwards to look at Chinese medicine, Indian, Middle East, and also indigenous Australian traditional medicine. I thought that I will be continuing doing this as a researcher, a scientist. If you look up that news, you will see that I, I published a lot in, in this area as a senior scientist in Australia. But that's not God's plan. It's just a preparation for God's mission. In 2020, in that year of the COVID, I was in Melbourne teaching in RMIT University. God's word came to me. Daniel, you do not just concern about indigenous communities, the health and wealth but their whole being. They lead in the spiritual need. They need to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. So as a disciple of Jesus, I've decided to submit to this calling. So I quit my job in, in university, decided to come to morning college to study, to prepare myself for the theology training for the First Nations Gospel Discipleship Ministry. And I have decided to also sell my house in, in, in Melbourne. I, I pray to God. I said, God, give me a clear sign for my family so that 
it is, I can, my family can see it is your view. That's 2020. Again, today I'm not going to talk about that. How was that sign? You'll be in my newsletter. There are video link that you are able to see that as well. What I want to say is that now I finished the theology training. God also prepared me with that Baptist Mission Australia as my sending organization that partnering with me. So I've got my mentors. Some of the, you, you recognize the name, Reverend Jim Kime, some of you may know. When I say some, because he is not young anymore, because he is my mentor. He told me that in 1962, he became a missionary after his theology training in, as a missionary in Northern Territory, 1962, the year I was born. And he is my great mentor, and he reminded me, Daniel, in his generation, 70 to 80% of the indigenous people they have heard the gospel. It's not because of they haven't heard the gospel. What they need is discipleship. That the gospel really in their heart that made Jesus Christ not just their Savior, but their Lord. We sang the song, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King. So from there, I have partnership, and this is my ministry is all about. In urban, I pray that God will give me these indigenous Christian leaders involved in the discipleship, train them to prepare them to make more disciples of their nations. I will go to different churches, in particular, those like mine. I call myself third nations because I'm indigenous Chinese from Hong Kong. My parents and my parents, they were all indigenous from, from, from China. But we are indigenous people. We are Christian and God brought us across the ocean. Now we are in Australia and we are serving together for the people who have been here for tens of thousands of years, First Nations people. And I want to say, Narara Valley Baptist Church, you have a great tradition already. You have been serving, have the ministry in the Tari for 25 years. That is something that when I heard it, wow, I was so excited that I'm able to partner with you, to learn from you, and bring all many of these, my, these churches, many churches that come together to serve together. Not just to Tari, but for all the towns around here in the north. Next week, I also will be going to the west, Gilgendra, Dabo, and further. And the west to the further will be the Broken Hill. Pray for me. Pray for this ministry. So this is the prayer point that I put forward in July. I pray that God will give me two to four indigenous Christian leaders. And I, for the regional, I will learn more from my Gilgandra trip. And God listen. God hears our prayer and answer our prayer. And you could see that in my friends' giving. You probably can't see, and I can tell you, God already has given to indigenous Christian leaders, and we have started the discipleship group. And one of the indigenous Christian leaders named this disciple group or the future church, Emmanuel, God with us because we start reading the Bible, Matthew, each day, one chapter. Pray for me. Pray for these Christian leaders. Pray for this ministry. This is a spiritual warfare. This is about whether we are we disciples of Jesus that we give that kingship to Jesus. So I believe that Thanks again, Navrava Valley, for being a partner with me in this ministry. So, in the prayer, 
of the August, pray for this discipleship group that we will start not just to expand in number, but in terms of the discipleship that in each one of the indigenous Christian leaders, their heart being transformed so that the power of the gospel is in personal, their family, their community, and their relations. Praise God. Thank you. Pray for you before you go. Huh? Can I pray for yes. you? How about we pray right now? Uh, Lord God, we thank you for our brother Daniel uh, and for the opportunity uh, that you have given us uh, to partner with him, uh, to support him. Uh, Lord, we bring before you uh, his, his ministry, uh, both urban and regional, uh, to the First Nations leaders and churches and the people of this land. Uh, Lord God, uh, I thank you for Daniel's humility, uh, for his servant heart, uh, for his desire to do your will to be a blessing uh, to, these, to these people, to these leaders, to these churches. Uh, Lord, I do pray for uh, the discipleship work uh, that you have given him to do. Uh, Lord, for this Emmanuel group uh, in Sydney, uh, Lord, I pray that you would be really raising these leaders up and equipping them and training them and strengthening them uh, to follow you, uh, to lead others to follow you. And Lord, we pray for his trip to Gilgandra, uh, Lord, for uh, the regional work uh, that he's doing there and, and in other places as well. Uh, Lord God, I pray that you would go before him, preparing the way, uh, Lord, that there will be people in those places ready to receive him, uh, ready to be blessed. Uh, Lord, that uh, there'd be a real uh, movement of your spirit uh, amongst the First Nations people in New South Wales, uh, Lord, that... Uh, that you'd be raising up uh, more leaders, uh, that you'd use Daniel for that, uh, but that you would be the one doing that work. Uh, Lord, that those leaders would be equipped uh, and ready to serve you uh, for the good of, of your church uh, amongst our First Nations brothers and sisters. Uh, Lord, that uh, we'd really see your spirit moving uh, and, and people's lives changed uh, by you. Lord, I pray uh, that the work that Daniel is doing uh, would be uh, something that we can join in with, uh, something that we can really uh, get alongside him in, uh, and Lord, that we can all share in the struggles of it and the, uh, the, the difficulties and the challenges, uh, Lord, also that we can share in the joy of it, uh, to see you at work, to see you moving, and to see you changing lives. We pray all this trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, don't forget to get, to get a little card from the info desk on your way out. Uh, find Daniel, uh, and if you want to have lunch with us, let me know. We'd love to have you. Well, I've got a hint already what's next, uh, and that is, it's time for our, our preacher, Come on up, Josh. Um, oh, thank you. Um, Josh is our uh, expert on preaching about money, is that right? <laughs> I'm, I'm told, I'm innocent in this, but I'm told that before I came, last time Josh preached, he was asked to preach about money, and I've asked him to preach about money not knowing that we're forming a pattern here, but you're becoming the expert on preaching about money. Um, I preached about money last week, in fairness, in the PM. Uh, if you missed that, grab it on the podcast. Um, I did mean to mention, I'll just say this now, I got you up too early, didn't I? Um, I did mean to mention last week, in this For God Alone series, the preaching in the AM and the PM are on different topics. So if you are an AM faithful and you never come to PM, I would encourage you to listen to the PM podcast for this preaching series because you're only actually getting half the content if you only listen to the AM messages. Um, but I think this one's going to be great and you'll probably 
going to do a better job than I did last week on money. Um, so let me pray that that is true. <laughs> Uh, Lord God, we thank you for Josh. We thank you for his willingness uh, to to study your word uh, and to prepare something to share with us today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be working through your spirit right now, uh, that you give him uh, guidance, uh, the right words to say. Uh, Lord, that you'd open our ears and our hearts to receive uh, what you want to say to us. Uh, Lord, that we would hear you speak in this time as we study your word and hear from you hear from the words of Jesus. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Johnny. Oh, goodness. In this day and age, with this week gone by, he's going to preach on money. All right, kids. Come on, let's go. I think we've got half an hour till McDonald's breakfast menu finishes. No, I'm glad you're still hanging around. That's good. That's good. Um, no, I'm not necessarily going to talk about money today. Um, we, we have been going through a series on For God Alone, and it, it, it really kind of delves into living a life. What does it, living a life for God alone look like? And uh, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at uh, how we can live our lives uh, for God alone in our worship. And then uh, we've been looking at how we can live for God alone in our work. And uh, today, uh, we're going to have a look at how we can live for God alone with our possessions. So if you have a look, uh, and if you open up your Bibles or your apps to uh, Luke chapter 12, uh, obviously from the slide up there, uh, we're going to look at the rich fool, the parable of the rich fool. But before we do, Every day of our lives, we find ourselves being pulled in a lot of different directions. I love when people come and ask me, how was your week? And I think, oh, where do I start? Um, do I start with uh, my little grandson that's now four and a half weeks old? Do I talk about my wife? Do I talk about my kids? Do I talk about work? Do I talk about church? Do I talk about my own health? Do I talk about the fact that I had a haircut, um, went to the dentist? Um, where do I start? You, you see, our, our, our lives are pulled in just so many different directions. Uh, our obligations to so many things are just endless. And you might even be sitting here or watching on uh, your computer today with that question, what, what actually is important to me? You see, as we kind of think about all these different directions that we're being pulled, obviously there's something that's going to dominate our life. And it answers the question, what is really important in my life? And the passage that we've uh, got here today from Luke chapter 12 forces us to make a decision about what kind of life we want. Do we want a life dependent on things of this world or a life with no guarantee of any of the world's goods, but only to be close to God? I think we've had the, the greatest sermon illustration by Dr. Daniel this morning. Double doctorate? You're a bit of an overachiever. Come on. I think we're all thinking that. You're a very clever man, sir. But uh, after all his accomplishments and everything, to, to give that up and to go into, into full-time ministry is just absolutely incredible. And yet God calls us all to a, world that, to a, to a life that's more dedicated to him. So this passage is really important and relevant to us today because for most people today, the main priority of, in life is to attain enough money to live the good life. That's pretty much sums up the life of most people in our society. We're, we're bombarded on television and in media and on our computers with beautiful houses, uh, fashion, technological gadgets, food, all these kinds of things, showing us what we don't have and what we need to have. And today, no matter what anyone possesses, someone else has got something bigger, something better, something newer, something different. And especially in our society, the distance between being comfortable and being covetous may actually not be so great. 
So Jesus is in the middle of a, a fantastic sermon sharing about what living for God alone looks like. And uh, earlier in chapter 12, he, he warns uh, those who have been listening, and it's quite a crowd, in fact, a crowd of many thousands, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, uh, that they're trampling on one another. And Jesus starts talking about how God will provide for their needs, uh, to be on their guard against the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, uh, and to acknowledge that God is the pr provider of all, and that we should put our faith in him. And in the middle of his sermon, some guy yells out, and we pick it up at verse 13. Someone in the crowd says to Jesus, Teacher, will you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, ah, this is what I'll do. I'll tell, tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things. Sorry. There we go. And he told, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. So Jesus is in the middle of this sermon and a, a guy interrupts his sermon with this very, oh, in, in the middle of a thousands of people, this very personal issue that he has. And he wants to share it with the world. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, down through history, there have been innumerable families that have been absolutely destroyed over a thing as simple as the distribution of assets. I, I've known many families where certain members have become angry with other members of the family over the way the estate has been divided. And sadly, they don't speak to each other again for many years. And yet this man really didn't ask Jesus for a decision on what would be a fair division for, of the estate. He just demanded of Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus did not answer the way that he was expected to. And thankfully, Jesus never answers those kinds of questions the way that we all expect him to do. And in fact, in verse 14, he says to the man, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? You see, Jesus actually refuses to be sidetracked from his mission of seeking and saving the lost. In, instead, Jesus doesn't make a, a legal judgment, but he actually makes a moral one. Jesus knows that this family feud over inheritance was really only a symptom of a greater problem, a greater problem of greed. In fact, the you in verse 14 is, is plural, and it indicates that both the brothers had, have a problem with this greed. They're, they're fighting over this inheritance. You can imagine uh, for days that they've been fight, literally fighting with each other over this money. Both of them are wanting to hold on to that money as much as they could. As long as both brothers are suffering from greed, no settlement was going to be satisfactory. And so Jesus tells them that the most important thing is not for him to solve this problem, 
but that there needs to be a change of heart, a change of heart. And if we're honest, how often have we gone to, uh, to God asking him to change our situation when really what we need is a change of our own heart? I dare to say that most of our prayers are that God would solve a problem, a particular problem in our lives. And yet perhaps maybe our prayer should be, God, here's my problem. How would you like to change my heart? So in verse 15, Jesus says to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. You see, the danger for this man was a greed. The Greek word is pleonexia, and it means to lust after, to have more than your fair share, a grasping for more that is never satisfied, or to put it another way, to want more of what you already have enough of. And that's kind of the situation where this man or that these two brothers were. They were very much satisfied with, well, they had enough to live on and yet they craved more. And in fact, it, it's a theme that pops up throughout the Bible. Back in the Old Testament, Proverbs 21 speaks of this very problem when it says, All day long a man craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. The writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 5 verse 10 says, Those who love money will never have enough. How absurd to think that wealth brings true happiness. But is that not exactly how many of us think today? How many of us think that if we could just win the lotto or get a, a scratchy ticket that actually gives us some money, then we can live the good life. In fact, Chuck Swindoll pictures it this way. Picture a, a shipwrecked sailor on a life raft in the middle of the ocean and his terrible thirst impels him to drink the salt water of the ocean. And we all know that that salt water makes him even more thirsty. And so he drinks more of the ocean water, which makes him incredibly more thirsty. And it just gets on and on and on until paradoxically, he becomes dehydrated and dies. So Jesus now addresses what we can term the folly of seeking the comfortable life uh, by his uh, statement, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And yet greed tries to convince us of entirely the opposite, that life does consist in what we own. Malcolm Forbes of the Forbes magazine merely reflected our society when he said, the one who dies with the most toys wins. You've heard that saying, right? Unfortunately, Mr. Forbes has since passed away and I'm sure that he doesn't believe in that now. And yet greed is an issue of the heart. It's an issue of our motivation for life. It's, a, it's an obsession for what we go after. And that is often about our own pleasure. And so beginning in verse 16, Jesus starts telling this very brief little parable of a rich fool. And today, really quickly, I want to share with you five different uh, things that Jesus teaches about what happens when people and their hearts are focused exclusively on themselves. And hopefully, you might not resonate with any of these or perhaps even be challenged by any of these that Jesus brings to, to us through this passage today. The first one, as it says up there, when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we actually don't give the credit for things that God has done. In the parable, Jesus says, this certain man is blessed with an abundant harvest. And this parable is, is shared with just so many people in, in, this, uh, in this crowd. And yet he's also speaking to these brothers. Making sure that everyone realises that he's telling the story that is applicable to all of us. 
there are times in which we are blessed. We are living a blessed life. But someone who is totally focused on themselves does not give the credit to God, but gives the, takes the credit for themselves. How hard I've worked. How, met, met, how many things I've done. The sacrifices I've made to get here. So many people think of that. And yet Jesus makes sure that we realize that we have to recognize that it's God that continues to bless us each and every day. But this rich fool, he's a fool for, one, for the first reason being that he doesn't give the credit to God. And those who focus them on themselves don't do this either. The second thing that uh, this man does, and when people who focus on themselves, is that they make plans but leave God out. He goes on to say, this uh, rich fool, oh, what shall I do with all this abundance of crops? I've just got no place big enough to store these crops. Oh, I'm going to actually tear down what I already have and build bigger ones tomorrow. And then I'll be able to store all my surplus grain. Now, there's nothing wrong to have a desire to grow. It's an, 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 a, a very much a thing that is wise and prudent. The problem laid in the fact that there was no thought of sharing, no thought of, of uh, um, letting anyone know about this. It was all for him. I'm going to build these these barns, these silos, and it's all going to set me up for the future. And you can see that as we look closer at this passage, that we find that the pronoun my and I come up 12 times in this little passage. It's all about me, 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 my, I, I, I. My crops, my barns, my goods. And frankly, we know as Jesus, followers of Jesus, that he's confused between ownership and stewardship. We know that nothing that we have in our possession belongs to us ultimately. It belongs to God. It's only on our, as ours on loan. So this man has left God completely out of, uh, of the picture, how he's obtained this, uh, this uh, uh, richness, but also of any plans that he's going to do to store everything for himself. Well, the third thing that we learn from people who have their hearts focused on themselves is that they consider spending their resources only on themselves. Again, the, the rich fool says in verse 19, I'll, I'll say to myself, you've got plenty of grain laid up for so many years. Oh, let's take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This man is thought to have put this plan together, which was good in his own eyes. And it would pay off benefits, not just for the next week, but for years to come. He was setting himself up for retirement. And before you think that putting stuff into your retirement plans is a bad idea, that's not what I'm saying. But all of this is based on the fact that this man thought he had control of the fate of his life in his own hands. We often live like that. We live with plans that it will, are inflexible, that we are focused on so much without recognizing that God is in control of the fate of each one of us. This man envisioned the future as continually expanding and under his control. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. James writes about such an attitude in chapter 4. He says, Now listen you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. 
And so it sounds like the Bible is actually discouraging us from looking towards the future and having any kind of expectations. But that would be totally wrong. It's that we need to lean, lean into God and His plans for us. And perhaps even having to sacrifice those things that we had anticipated and putting our trust in God and His plans for us. The fourth thing really quickly is that when our hearts are focused on ourselves, we store our treasure in the wrong places. God says to this this farmer, this man who has accumulated so much, he actually says, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? The man is pronounced a fool by God. A fool in biblical language is actually not a description of his mental ability, um, but of a spiritual discernment. According to Scripture, a fool is a person who leaves God out of any consideration. Psalm Psalm 14 verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. That's how the Bible pictures a fool. This man is not a fool because of his uh, failed thinking, but it's because he's left God out of his plans and of his life. He's a fool in that he didn't recognize that his material possessions really came as blessings from God. And he didn't recognize any obligation to God in the use of those possessions. Fools leave God out of their lives. The son-in-law of Martin Lloyd-Jones, an an English author of uh, many books, Sir Fred Catherwood, once said, Greed is the logical result of the belief that there is no life or death. We grab what we can while we can, however we can, and then hold on to it as hard as we can. Wonderful little story by Leo Tolstoy wrote a story about a, a successful peasant farmer who wasn't satisfied with his lot. He wanted more of everything. So one day, he received a very novel offer. For a thousand rubles, he could buy all the land he could that he could walk around in a day. He could have and possess the amount of land that he could circumnavigate in one day. The only catch in the deal was that he had to be back at his starting point before sundown. Well, early that morning, the farmer got out and started out walking at quite a pace. And by midday, he was quite tired, but he kept going, covering more ground and more ground. And when in the afternoon, he realized that his greed had taken him far away from the starting point, He quickened his pace, and as the sun began to sink low in the sky, he began to run, knowing that if he didn't make it back to his starting point by sundown, the opportunity to become an even bigger landholder was going to be lost. So as the sun began to sink slowly below the horizon, he came within sight of the finishing line, and gasping for breath, his heart pounding, he called upon every bit of strength left in his body and staggered across the starting line just before the sun disappeared. He immediately collapsed, blood streaming from his mouth, and in a few minutes he died. Afterwards, his servants dug a grave. He owned no more than six feet long and three feet wide. The title of Tolstoy's story, How Much Does a Man Need? How much does a man need? To be a fool is to have missed the point of life. The remarkable thing is that this person that God calls a fool, we'd actually call a success. Someone whose business is growing exponentially. It was a matter of his heart. 
Jesus says, that very night, your life will be demanded from you. That Greek word demanded is uh, literally means to demand back or require back, conveying the idea of a loan that must be repaid to God upon demand. And he goes on in the second half of that verse to say, then who will get what you prepared for yourself? Long before the great philosopher Solomon made a comment on this very problem in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He says, For a person may labour with wisdom, knowledge and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and such a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labour under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Since you can't take it with you, there's no need to wear yourselves out accumulating it. We need to put our faith and trust in a God that provides for us each and every day. It would be good for us to remember the words of the missionary Jim Elliott who said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain which he cannot lose. Okay, final thing. Fifth thing that Jesus teaches. When our hearts are focused on ourselves, we find ourselves in conflict with God's plan for our lives. Verse 21 says, this is how it will be with for, for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Riches have one major weakness. They have no purchasing power after we're dead. Does it? The rich towards God, however, have an everlasting benefit. What do you want to spend your life doing? accumulating things that will die with you or putting your motivations and desires and efforts into things that will last way beyond you. That's the challenge that Jesus makes to those people there and makes that challenge today. We come across, obviously, a financially difficult time over the next couple of years. May it not let us be beaten into thinking about what we don't have. Let's have that change of heart and recognise that God has brought us together as a church to unify, to help one another, to minister to each other and minister to our community when they most need it. May we have a change of heart that looks at the world the way God looks at it. And looks at our possessions the way God looks at our possessions. We have been blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. I'm going to ask the band to come up now as we reflect on that. But also remember that we are living totally countercultural to the rest of society. Where everyone wants to work for themselves, live for themselves, for their own pleasures. Jesus says that's not the essence of living. The essence of living is to glorify him and to look after our neighbours as we look after ourselves. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, what a challenging time we live in and a challenging passage to look at. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've placed upon us. Maybe not necessarily materially, perhaps just with relationships, perhaps in lots of different ways, we attribute blessings to you that you have bestowed upon us. Father, we thank you for them, but we also don't hold to them so tightly that we can't use these to benefit you and your kingdom. May we be generous, generous of heart, generous of time, and even of what we have, Lord. May we be useful for your kingdom and useful for those around us. Lord, open our eyes to those opportunities that we can help and love and share with one another today and in the days ahead. We thank you, Lord, in your precious name.
let's stand together and we're going to sing one more song together.
Yes, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for everything that you have blessed us with. For this life that you've given us, and for everything that we are, and for everything that we have, Lord, we give it all over to you. We acknowledge in our hearts that it was always yours. And Lord, we give it back to you. Lord, take who we are and what we have, take it and use it for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning here or online. Uh, I encourage you, if you are here, uh, to stick around, say hi uh, to Dr. Daniel. Um, you can even have lunch with us if you'd like. It's an open invite. Um, Come back this afternoon for the Ministry Partnership course. Oh, and next Sunday in the morning, uh, we're continuing our theme on uh, connecting with our First Nations brothers and sisters. Uh, Pastor Uncle Russ is going to come, and he'll be preaching and sharing with us next Sunday morning, so don't miss that. Make sure you come or tune in. See you then. Faithful promises.